Dr. Jennifer Chatfield, and I've responded to a multitude of disasters, including national special security events where we provided on-site working animal veterinary support, as well as hurricanes and infectious disease outbreaks. And if you'll notice, in every one of these pictures, I'm with a team. And you'll hopefully find that theme throughout this discussion because preparedness and response and anything related to disasters really are really team sports. And you have to begin to engage your team right from the jump when you start talking about preparedness. If you think about the pandemic and everything that came along with it, it was very much a team event. And so hopefully you'll start to gather your team together. And while I do enjoy disaster response and those discussions, I like to talk about preparedness because it sometimes can obviate the need for me as a responder. Before 2020, nearly every veterinary continuing education meeting tried to include at least something about disasters. After the last 18 months, unless you've been living under a rock, you've become acutely and intensely aware of the impact of a natural disaster on all of us. But are you more prepared for the next one? For a different type of disaster? Well, following this video, I hope you have at least a handful of concrete steps you can take, whether you're a practice owner, an associate veterinarian, a technician, a receptionist, a parent, a kid, a Frenchie, a Himalayan cat. Well, you get the picture, right? So let's get into it, friends. Disaster, it's a charged term with many different meanings. Does anyone think this is a disaster? How about this? We're pretty sure this is a disaster. If you ask me, as a newly graduated practitioner, I thought a disaster was ripping an ovarian pedicle during a spay surgery to treat a pyometra and a 150 pound chocolate lab owned by an attorney, married to another attorney. Oof, of course, I jest, but not really. How do you define a disaster? More importantly, how do we best weather disasters once they arrive? Well, if statistics are to be believed, recovery from any disastrous or abnormal circumstance is largely dependent on the thoroughness of one's preparations. Preparedness is the key to disaster recovery and effective preparation is typically tailored to the type of disaster. Okay then, so now we're back to defining precisely what is a disaster. Luckily, you and I do not have to worry about agreeing on the definition of a disaster because the government does that for us. Again, I joke. Of course, multiple definitions of disaster exist, but for the context of this presentation, we will refer to the definition as provided by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. A disaster is an occurrence of a natural catastrophe, technological accident, or human-caused event that has resulted in severe property damage, deaths, and or multiple injuries. And as used in the federal guide, a large scale disaster is one that exceeds the response capability of the local jurisdiction and requires state and potentially federal involvement. As used in the Stafford Act, a major disaster is any natural catastrophe or regardless of cause, any fire, flood, or explosion in any part of the United States, which in the determination of the president causes damage of sufficient severity and magnitude to warrant major disaster assistance under the act to supplement the efforts and available resources of states, local governments, and disaster relief organizations in alleviating the damage, loss, hardship, or suffering caused thereby. Okay, it's a federal definition written by lawyers. So of course it's an entire paragraph. For all intents and purposes, a quick and dirty definition is any event that overwhelms existing resources. So for some communities, quote, small events may qualify. In some areas, a multi-car accident may overwhelm the hospital facilities, thus constituting a healthcare disaster situation. A multi-unit fire may overwhelm a community's fire department and resources, thus constituting a disaster. I share these examples to highlight the fact that disasters are not limited to 
earthquakes, tsunamis, hurricanes, floods, volcanic eruptions, or pandemics. Is it too soon? Infectious disease outbreaks are natural disasters and can be just as impactful, although typically less overt than the classics I listed. At least less overt before the response to SARS coronavirus too. But I digress. Preparing for, responding to, and recovering from disasters has been going on since the beginning of time. I mean, it's not like I was there, but... The 1556 Shaanxi earthquake in China reportedly caused over 830,000 deaths, reducing the population of the two affected provinces by a whopping 60%, and it's one of the earliest reported natural disasters. The 1887 Chinese Yellow River flood is commonly regarded as the world's second worst natural disaster by death toll, with an estimated 900,000 to 2 million fatalities. The 1931 Chinese flood is considered one of the world's worst natural disasters with a death toll of 1 to 4 million people. These floods were caused by the Yangtze Wai River and are still widely considered to be the deadliest floods in the history of mankind. Fast forward to the 21st century and we find earthquakes continue to top the lists with the Haitian earthquake of 2010 being the world's most recent large-scale disaster with more than 316,000 deaths and billions of dollars of damages. Japan's Tohoku earthquake and subsequent tsunami, which impacted the Fukushima power plant in 2011, were the world's most expensive natural disasters, producing more than $360 billion in damages. Now, going back to our definition of disaster, I mentioned the Stafford Act. The full name of it is actually the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act. And it's a federal law that was passed in 1988. The Stafford Act lays out how aid will be requested from the federal government and criteria that need to be met. It also defines two different declarations, emergency declarations and major disaster declarations. An emergency declaration can be declared for any occasion or instance when the president determines federal assistance is needed. Emergency declarations supplement state and local efforts in providing emergency services, such as the protection of lives, property, public health and safety, or to lessen or avert the threat of a catastrophe in any part of the United States. The total amount of assistance provided for a single emergency may not exceed $5 million. If this amount is exceeded, the president shall report that to Congress. The president can declare a major disaster for any natural event, including any hurricane, tornado, storm, high water event, wind-driven water, tidal wave, tsunami, earthquake, volcanic eruption, landslide, mudslide, snowstorm, or drought, or regardless of cause, any fire, flood, or explosion that the president believes has caused damage of such severity that it is beyond the combined capabilities of state and local governments to respond. A major disaster declaration provides a wide range of federal assistance programs for individuals and public infrastructure, including funds for both emergency and permanent work. It's that carrot of federal funding and access to other resources that largely drives the standardization of disaster planning and response activities in the United States. If states want federal support when they need it, then state activities must comply with federal guidance. Before we dive into what that compliance looks like and how it can impact veterinary practitioners, because it can, let's look at the top five states for natural disasters. I mean, the top five states where presidents have declared the most major disasters based on FEMA data from the last 67 years. Because I think a couple of them might surprise you. Number five. Florida. Florida has had 160 major disasters declared since 1953. Because it's situated between the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico, Florida is especially vulnerable to hurricanes, and 2017's Hurricane Irma and 2018's Hurricane Michael were both Category 5 storms and were some of the strongest and most destructive in the state's recent history. Florida has also experienced fires, floods, severe storms, and a tornado or two. 
After Florida at number five comes number four, the state of Washington. The state of Washington has had 177 major disasters declared since 1953. Washington experienced a devastating fire season in 2020, burning more than 700,000 acres. The Evergreen State has also endured floods, mudslides and landslides, severe storms, earthquakes, and the 1980 Mount St. Helens volcano eruption. Woof! Number three is Oklahoma. Oklahoma has had 210 major disasters declared since 1953. It's situated within Tornado Alley, and Oklahomans are familiar with twisters. In 2013, the Moore tornado was especially devastating and is one of the deadliest in Oklahoma's history. The Sooner State has also experienced wildfires, floods, snow, and severe winter storms, all since 1953. Coming in at number two is California. Yeah, the state of California has had 336 major disasters declared since 1953. Like Oregon and Washington to its north, California experienced a record fire season in 2020, burning more than 4 million acres across the state. The Golden State has also experienced earthquakes, floods, drought, and severe storms, all of these over the last 67 years. And the big winner for most declared major disasters in the last 67 years is Texas, with a whopping 360 major disasters since 1953. Texas is the second largest state by area and is the most disaster prone in the country. In 2017, Hurricane Harvey devastated Texas, and it's been called the worst natural disaster in the state's history. The Lone Star State has also endured floods, tornadoes, severe ice storms, and drought. But it's still number one in my heart, as it's my home state. Now that we know where natural disasters most often occur in the United States, and we know a bit of global disaster history, let's get back to how all this is going to help veterinary practitioners. Because you might not realize how federal relief acts, governor's orders, and mutual aid agreements might impact you. I find it helpful when talking about disaster preparedness to at least visualize the bigger picture. The federal funding carrot that I mentioned requires some standardization of structure for disaster planning and response by local and state governments, and it's good to be aware of that structure. Disaster planning and response in the U.S. generally adheres to a structure and system called the Incident Command System, or ICS. ICS is a modernized hybrid of a couple of large organizational efforts in our country's history. Beginning with the Military Reorganization Act of the 1940s, where we streamlined wartime decision making, while still grounding such decisions in real-time intelligence from the field. Basically, it said that missions would float up from the boots on the ground more productively than being handed down from command on high. That approach is great during disaster response efforts. Then, a program that successfully integrated volunteers and multiple cross-jurisdictional agencies into wildland firefighting efforts, called FireScope, added chain of command structure to ICS and provided for supervisory recommendations as far as how many people can be supervised effectively by a single person. And then finally, some best practices from the private sector. All these things combined to create the incident command structure, which is the basis for organization of the majority of the U.S. government-led disaster responses today. And also how Dr. Jen the Vet loves for things to run. Now, many of you have likely completed the very basic on-demand training in the incident command system that's offered by FEMA. And that's a start. If you've completed that, then you know that in ICS, basically, you get your assignment or your mission and you stay in your box. The schematic is designed as a bunch of boxes for a reason, and staying in that box can be very challenging for veterinarians who are accustomed to being in charge, always, at all times, over all people. But you get it. Going from being the person on which everything in the galaxy depends to being a person on whom some things depend can be difficult at best 
for many of us. However, it can also be liberating, doctor. I'm going to share with you the key to successful and happy execution of the incident command system. That key is get in your box and stay in your box. Make yourself aware of who is directly above you and who is directly below you. Now, you can peer out of your box to maintain awareness, but do not leave your box. Remember these few key basics and you're well on your way to a successful experience. Oh, one more subtle nuance to ICS is that the incident commander sets the goals while the operations section chief determines the objectives to accomplish in order to achieve those goals. This is sometimes a difficult and sophisticated nuance for those in leadership. Okay, that's my Cliff's Notes version of ICS for Disasters. Preparing to face disastrous situations is not foreign to veterinarians. Remember my disastrous Pio Spay nightmare? Right. We are always preparing for the worst while hoping for the best. So not only is planning and preparedness in our professional nature, it's the smart thing to do, doctor. If you're thinking to yourself right now, plan? I, I don't have a plan. Hey, remain calm, friend. If you don't have an official plan for your practice or your family or your business, you're likely not alone. Despite the fact that it's in our nature, many of us don't plan for disasters. A lot of small business owners don't plan for disasters. A survey of 600 small businesses in 2012 found that 74% of American small businesses do not have a disaster plan. 84% do not have adequate insurance. And 71% lack a backup generator. Well, that's tricky if you live in Florida. The good news is that the same survey found that 62% of respondents said that they could operate their business via mobile phone. Great! While 30% said they stored their information in the cloud. Yeah, maybe that's not that positive an indicator since I'm not sure how we would run our practices from a phone because despite the rise in popularity of telemedicine, Eventually, we got to show up in person. We got to lay hands on that animal or at least eyes. And if nearly three quarters of businesses are without a plan, how important is the plan anyway? I mean, plans require effort, time, and that usually means money. Money and time spent in preparedness efforts can be worth their weight in gold. As the U.S. Small Business Administration says, 25% of small businesses never reopen following a disaster impact. 25%. And while many people quote an additional statistic stating that 90% of small businesses fail in two years following a disaster, I'm not sure how much I trust that one. Let's face it, many small businesses fail in the first one to two years without a disaster. Business is hard. But the more likely accurate statistic is that 90% of smaller businesses fail within a year of a disaster unless they can resume operations within five days. Okay, yeah, that tracks. Imagine five days of forced closure on your practice without forethought or planning. Either way, whichever statistic is accurate, preparing your practice to survive a natural disaster is money and time well spent. Step number one in survival is getting a plan together. Then you must share the plan, doctor, with everyone on the team. And that team is large. That's your staff, family, associates, anyone who makes your practice go on a daily basis. Third, practicing or exercising the plan is key. And that can look like just sitting around with the people involved and talking through a handful of the most likely situations. A rousing game of if then constitutes a great exercise. If we lose electricity, then we need a generator that can hook into the building and for which we have fuel on hand. You get the idea. While this may seem like a game, it's actually quite helpful and maybe quite professionally called a tabletop exercise. You may have heard of such continuity of operations planning efforts referred to as a coop. 
However, in the case of small businesses, rather than government entities, it is likely more accurately referred to as a business continuity plan, since the goal of such preparation is not necessarily to have consistent operation despite the calamitous event, but rather for the practice or the entity to survive response and recovery from the disaster. Continuity of operations may be ideal. However, business continuity for your practice is more likely a more realistic goal for most of us and a more appropriate term for these activities, business continuity. So where do these types of plans usually fail? Where do they fall down? I don't think it would be a large surprise to anyone that communication is a huge area in need of improvement for most businesses on the daily, including veterinary practices. Heck, communication needs to be improved in most practices outside of disasters and planning. However, in the context of disaster preparedness, improved communication about the fact that a plan exists not only improves the practice's performance when faced with a disaster, but perhaps more importantly, it effectively communicates to your skilled staff that there's a plan and they will have a job and they will be needed post-disaster. Because many businesses that rely on skilled and trained staff find themselves unable to resume operations at a normal level following a disaster because all the staff are gone. I mean, have you tried to go out to eat lately? It's like my dad used to say when I was growing up at the farm and I wondered why, as a seven or eight year old, I had to stand right there and watch while he did something until he needed me to go get something or hold this or do that or provide any other little bit of aid I could that he may have required. Well, finally, years later, he let me in on the secret. He said it's unwise to let the help go away (laughs) because just as sure as he would have let me go off to play in the yard or go do something else in the house, he would have needed me to hold something or go get the screwdriver or go get a hammer or whatever, and I wouldn't have been there. Then he has to stop what he's doing and go get me, find me, get me back to where he's, he's working. The same principle applies to your skilled staff following a disaster at your practice. So why not include them in your preparation activities to instill confidence in them that there is a plan, they will have a job, the practice will go on. Because when disasters hit, people leave. They bail out of the area. They get the heck out of Dodge. Sometimes because they were told to do so. Other times because they're afraid. They don't know what's going to happen. Uncertainty is very unsettling. So give your team members a reason to come back. They are needed. They are appreciated. And they will get paid. It is important that your team is confident that following whatever calamitous event Their presence will make a difference and they should find their way back. It's that confidence in business continuity that will bring them back. Not only does this ensure help to ensure the practice will have appropriate staffing to continue to resume operations, but it also puts in the front of everyone's mind the fact that they need to get a plan for their family. Because that's the other thing you wanna make sure of, that all of your staff are prepared in their own lives for such a disaster. So what are some specific things that I think people usually forget? Everyone knows it's always a good idea to have a generator. A generator and a helicopter for the island scenario. Yeah, but you need a generator. Electricity can really make or break it on any given day. But if you're going to have a generator, you need to have fuel for that generator to run. And you need to make sure the generator will run. Many people talk about ways to communicate with your team. And I don't just mean a phone tree with phone numbers. I mean some organized method by which you're all going to reach out and touch each other so that you know what we're all doing tomorrow, if we're doing something tomorrow. And after leading facilities through more than six hurricanes, my brother likes to say, you should not have a contact tree or a phone tree. You should have a contact bush so that redundancy is key even in these simple activities such as reaching out to each other. Don't forget that it would be helpful to have multiple avenues to use to communicate with your clients as well. Let them know that you're there or that you're not so that they can plan accordingly. Make friends with your local emergency management entity, whether that's the county level or at the city level. Let them know that you're planning to remain operational if at all possible. And let them know that you may 
or may not need specific things from them in order to do so. These days, not every veterinary practice sells as much pet food as they used to. And so during specific times of the year where your location may be more prone to natural disasters, you want to be sure to have additional food on hand, not only for your clients who may need it, but also for any hospitalized pets, if some are hospitalized when the disaster strikes, or for staff pets. It's not really possible to overemphasize the need for backing up any digital materials that are crucial to your practice. I mean, hello, 21st century. By that, I mean medical records. If you are paper light or paperless, you need to be sure that not only do you have things backed up, but that the backup is safe. You don't want to be that practice owner or practitioner who says, sure, I have everything backed up on these hard drives right here. And they're underwater right next to your primary hard drive or server. Additionally, Make sure that somewhere you have written down the name and contact information for your insurance policies. Oh yeah, you should have insurance policies and you should make sure that you at least have annual contact with that agent. Take pictures of the inside of your practice, what it looks like, where the equipment is. In this day and age, you don't need a thousand word description. You just need one picture from your cell phone to put into your digital file that you can use to file insurance claims following any sort of disaster that impacts your equipment. And all of this information could be contained in your planning document. And in fact, there are a couple of wizards online that you can use to prompt yourself to gather all this information. You don't have to invent your own wheel. You can simply answer the questions and it will populate a planning document for you that covers most things that generic businesses would need to have in a plan. Then it's up to you to go through that, make sure that you have at least answered all of your if-then questions. Now, while much of this may seem like obvious stuff, please bear in mind it is still important. And it's actually not always that obvious. For example, when I deployed as part of the immediate response to Superstorm Sandy in New York City, I met with local practitioners who had in an effort to increase efficiency and comfort at their practice, placed hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment like digital x-ray systems, their surgical suite, etc., in the basement floor of their practice. They were not aware that they had declined a flood insurance rider that cost very little at the time that left them with a huge loss when the basement flooded from Superstorm Sandy, and none of those damages were covered. Moving on from planning and preparedness activities, what should we expect from different types of disasters in the aftermath, in response and recovery? After 2020, I think many of us who've worked in disaster response for years are a little bit less certain about how to reply to that question. <sighs> but in reality, not many things have changed from pre-COVID till now. So let's look at what we know happens following different types of disasters and how that's going to impact a veterinary professional. Since we likely all have infectious disease outbreaks on the brain these days, let's get that topic out of the way right off the bat. Not all natural disasters result in massive disease outbreaks, just so you know. However, there is a relationship between disasters and epidemics. According to Watson et al., the risk factors for outbreaks after disasters are associated primarily with population displacement, the availability of safe water and sanitation facilities, the degree of crowding, the underlying health status of the population, and the availability of healthcare services all interact within the context of the local disease ecology to influence the risk for communicable diseases and death in the affected population. Breaking it down, risk factors for outbreaks following disasters are associated with population displacement, safe water and sanitation, population density or crowding, underlying health status, and availability of healthcare services. So what does all of this mean on the ground? It means that following the overwhelming of existing resources, a community can expect the exacerbation of existing chronic underlying diseases, not necessarily epidemics of foreign diseases. Beyond exacerbation of existing problems, what else can you expect? Well, people are going to freak out and panic. Remember the great toilet paper panic of 2020? Yeah, people freak out. Right. 
People will do stupid stuff with great good intention. Animal issues typically present themselves once the human issues are resolving. Not resolved but resolving. When people have a minute to metaphorically begin to look around and notice more things that are going on around them, that's when animal issues most often crop up. Specifically, most communities will see an increase in animal bites during disaster response and recovery for multiple reasons. One of those is that many people want to help in disaster responses. Many people want to help with animal issues and volunteer. A desire to help is not always accompanied by significant training or knowledge, and lack of adequate personnel training or experience oftentimes leads to miscommunication between humans and animals, and a bite. Animals are stressed in disasters just like people. When stressed animals are engaging with stressed humans, and everyone is stressed and edgy, and while typically there will be a brief increase in the population of stray, free-roaming, and feral animals, most bites occurring as a result of disaster response are by domesticated animals that are known to the victim. Yep, people's pets bite them when they're scared. Rocket science. Communities typically see an increase in parasitic diseases also, such as hookworms, fleas, ticks, and yes, mange. Animals' immune systems are distressed. Routine preventives are not necessarily an owner's priority. Schedules are upended, and it may take months to return to what they were. Vector-borne diseases such as heartworms, West Nile virus, and plasmodium, or avian malaria, typically proliferate following disasters with flooding and significant rainfall. But it's not only mosquito-borne diseases that may see a spike in incidence. Tick-borne disease also spikes following hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, etc especially if populations are displaced and housing becomes a real dramatic issue. The wildlife interface can become pretty blurry, allowing for an increased risk for contact with not only wildlife, but their parasites as well. So let's look at some specific diseases of interest for which appropriate circumstances for proliferation exist following most natural disasters, shall we? As disasters are impacting native wildlife as well as humans, and domesticated species, it's important to remember that rabies persists in the United States. And the domesticated species that is most often rabid? Cats. Uh, combine that bit of data with the fact that cats are, in my opinion, the animal on the planet that is least receptive to change, and yeah, that makes for a perfect storm of less than ideal outcomes for cats and disasters. Because of this, it behooves veterinarians to actively and aggressively encourage cat owners to make a plan and execute their evacuation or response plan early for cat's sake. As a quick review, multiple different strains of rabies are present in the U.S., but not canine rabies. Just as squares are rectangles, but all rectangles are not squares, canine rabies does not exist in the U.S., but rabies in canines does. I know, right? Crazy. Raccoon, fox, coyote, skunk, and mongoose rabies strains are an issue. And let's not forget bats, friends. If any of these rabies reservoir species come into meaningful contact with a domesticated animal, recommending boosting existing rabies vaccination is appropriate. Moving on, leptospirosis may also proliferate following most natural disasters associated with water. And it's a zoonotic disease as well. So leptospira species are most often encountered via contaminated food or water. Contaminated by whom, you ask? Well, by any infected animal. As lepto is most often shed in urine, it's treated with a course of appropriate antibiotics such as penicillin, doxycycline, or a fluorinated quinolone. What's even better than effective treatment options, you may ask? Prevention! Take the opportunity to promote awareness of vaccinations against leptospirosis as your disaster season approaches. According to recent data, small breed, urban dwelling, unvaccinated dogs are at the highest risk for infection with lepto. A recent large investigation into metadata surrounding vaccinations and adverse reactions discovered that vaccines containing lepto did not present any higher risk of a vaccine adverse reaction. Well, that's interesting. So what are you waiting for? Protect those pets. 
Beyond exacerbation of underlying infectious diseases, natural disasters can impact other diseases as well, like diabetes. That's a chronic underlying disease in a community. As your region's disaster season approaches, whether that's hurricane season, tornado season, or wildland fire season, reach out to your clients with diabetic pets. Raise their awareness of the calendar and make sure that they are prepared with insulin and consumables on hand. Insulin's not very useful in a bottle without a syringe and needle. Just in case they need to evacuate their home in short order. Consider preparing a quick tips fact sheet for your diabetic patients and their owners on early signs of a diabetic ketoacidosis event for cats or a hypoglycemic event in a dog and what they can do about it, what items should be in a crisis kit for these special pets so that their owners are ready. Overall, disaster response and recovery is truly a reflection of the degree of preparedness. Many small businesses fail to see the value in any preparedness activities, especially for low likelihood, high impact events. As veterinarians, we really do not have the luxury of denial. We are all dedicated to providing aid to our patients, their families, and our communities. So make it easier to provide more comprehensive aid to all those that you care for and about by investing some time in developing a plan and sharing that plan with your entire team. The simple act of discussing the ins and outs of the plan during a lunch meeting can provide your team the stability to be the rock your community needs during disastrous times. I'm Dr. Jen the Vet, and I so very much appreciate your time, attention, and interest in disaster preparedness and response. And I hope to not see you as part of a federal response effort. I hope that you're prepared to stand up on your own and help stand your community back up and continue to take pride in our profession as veterinarians. <laughs>